Looking over your shoulder for the next generation, Wildcat. It's designed to be untethered. Four-legged robots have their uses, but events like the recent Fukushima nuclear disaster have renewed interest in the human form. Radiation kept people at bay, away from all available rescue equipment, from cars to power tools to shut-off valves. But imagine if there had been an easily controlled humanoid robot to operate them. Robotics engineers have been working on that for years. In 2009, Boston Dynamics introduced Petman, a robot that balanced itself, walked, and even did some calisthenics. Over the last few years, Petman has evolved into Atlas, which has even more mobility. Just like LS3, it actively balances itself all the time. And in this impressive demo, all by itself, it uses its arms to work its way past a hole in the floor. Today, they're tweaking its sense of balance on one foot. Looking at what tests to do here, we studied gymnasts. And when they are just about to fall off, you'll notice that they throw their arms and their legs around very violently. So we're trying to understand what techniques they're using to build a robot that can really handle rough terrain. They've been doing this test for only a week. First, the robot goes up onto one foot. Then, they hit it with a 20-pound medicine ball. If you notice there, it's swinging its arms and legs all around in kind of a clockwise fashion. And that momentum helps move the center of mass back over the feet. Not dissimilar to the way the gymnasts do it. Now let's see some human dynamic balancing. Yeah. The robot's blind. It doesn't know the ball's coming. Oh, so we wow. don't want you to know the ball's coming either. Oh. And so we've got a little um, blinder there for you so you don't see the ball coming. Oh, great. So I don't know <laughs> when the ball's coming. That's right. I have a feeling if your stinking hunk of silicon and hydraulics can do it, I can, of course, do it too. That's right. Side by side, it's hard to say who does it better. The Atlas seems more stable. But I have a few other tricks up my sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> I admire your robot, sir. Well, I admire you wearing those glasses on public television. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be seeing more of this guy. Atlas is the hardware used by seven software development teams in an international rescue robot competition. But a single, sophisticated, and expensive robot like Atlas is just one strategy. What about a less expensive and less complex machine, but more of them? That's the idea behind Harvard University's RoboBee. It would take 30 of these to equal the weight of a penny. What happens when you move beyond having just one robot, and instead have a swarm? In the future, Swarms of robots operating as a team might build our skyscrapers or map uncharted areas or scout out victims in disasters as robotic search and rescue teams. But in order to do any of that, engineers must solve a problem nature solved eons ago. How do you get a group of individuals to work together as one? In nature, swarms often behave as if they have a collective intelligence, whether it's fish schooling in the sea or birds flying in a flock. The members act in unison, without anyone apparently in charge. Some of the achievements built out of this swarm intelligence are awe-inspiring, like this murmuration by thousands of starlings. Or these complicated towers built several feet high by blind termites. So what can we learn from behavior in nature about creating robotic swarms? B.J. Kumar and his students at University of Pennsylvania have been wrestling with the problem. They use a fleet of hand-sized quad rotor robots, which they've learned to manipulate with impressive control. 
they can play the theme from James Bond. Or put on a light show. In both performances, the quad rotors are individually controlled by a central computer. But they've also built some computing power into individual robots so they can think for themselves, like figuring out how and when to fly through a tossed hoop. Now VJ is taking the next step, developing software that will allow the bots to work together as a swarm, a team that can do more than any single flyer can. One flying bot, pretty cool. Eight flying bots, it gets a little swarm in here. So what you see here is these robots commanded to rise into a swarm. They're asked to form patterns, three-dimensional patterns, and then the robots figure out what point in the pattern to step into and how to coordinate with their neighbors. Oh, so the master computer doesn't say, you, be in the corner. It's just saying, be a rectangle, be a circle, but they have to decide how to execute that? Right. While a central computer could control each of the eight robots individually, telling them where to go, VJ wants a system that scales up. And with more robots, no computer could keep up. So instead, he's taken inspiration from swarms in nature and developed three guiding principles. First, as much as possible, just as in nature, each robot thinks for itself. Second, each robot acts primarily on local information it gathers, the way a bird in a flying flock probably pays attention only to its immediate neighbors to know where to go. Finally, no one robot is in charge. They're all interchangeable, so that if one breaks down, the group continues. To test out those principles, VJ turns his fleet over to me and lets me experiment. The flyers know they're supposed to make a circle. As I add them one at a time, you can see it take shape. Or I can randomly pluck one out of the air, proving none is essential, and put it back somewhere else. Its neighbors adapt. Of all the possible applications, VJ sees a big future for swarms in search and rescue, and he shows me how it would work. So imagine you have a victim. You can imagine robots wandering around looking for maybe a cell phone signal that might tell you where uh, the victim is. Find that, robot drones. I'm telling these bots to move. The, the, the numbers of the bots. The numbers of the bots, they're all moving around. All right, there they go. They've chosen independent routes. In this demonstration, run by one of VJ's grad students, the robots roam the floor, measuring the strength of a signal transmitted by our lost victim's cell phone. They share their readings, creating a map. In effect, the transmitter is saying, warmer, warmer. Cooler, cooler. But the robots know not to trust any one sensor reading too much. The swarm of robots cut the overall search time by gathering information faster than a single robot could leading to the rescue of our lost little guy. Well, right now it's a lab study, but this sort of illustrates one of the directions in which we want to go, which is you take very simple robots with very simple sensors, so they're inexpensive, you put them together, and suddenly you have the benefits of these robots collaborating to do things that they individually cannot do. And that illustrates what swarm technology can really do for you. We've seen how nature has inspired the way robots look, how they move, and even how they act in concert in swarms. But living things have also inspired engineers on a more fundamental level, the very stuff we make things out of, our materials. Many of our modern materials have taken their cues from the natural world, especially plastics. Silk, the product of worms, inspired nylon. And the search for a substitute for rubber led to the invention of polystyrene, the stuff we often call styrofoam. But natural materials also hold hidden secrets, tiny structures invisible to the naked eye that can give them nearly magical properties, 
properties we can mimic. For example, the tips of microscopic hairs on the feet of wall-climbing geckos have led to the creation of material for wall-climbing robots. So the hunt is on. What other secrets might living materials reveal? I've traveled to Harvard University to meet materials scientist Joanna Eisenberg. She's taking me to see a plant with tiny structures on its surface that play a slick trick, one we might use for new materials in sticky situations. Oh, creepy. Little shop of horrors. What is this plant? This is a pitcher plant. Carnivorous plant. It eats stuff. It eats insects. It's called the pitcher plant for its pitcher-shaped leaves. Though when it comes to ants and other insects, these pitchers throw a mean curve. In dry weather, ants can easily walk on the lips of the pitchers using their sticky, oily feet. But in wet conditions, the ants and their oily feet get a little shop of horrors surprise. Here's how the trick works. On a dry day, the surface of the pitcher plant looks like this. No problem for the ants. But add water, and it sticks to the bumpy surface, creating a slippery wet film. A slip and slide for ants. All these insects just slide into digestive juices inside the organism. They fall in? And they're hydroplaning inside this, the plant. Cool. To Joanna, the pitcher plant's slippery when wet strategy seemed a promising start for developing new non-stick materials, but only a start. It evolved this structure to capture prey. It didn't evolve this structure to create these slippery materials on metals, on plastics, on glass. So this is where material scientists come. Let's design something similar. Taking the pitcher plant as inspiration, Joanna has developed a new non-stick surface treatment, a new way to keep stuff clean. She calls it slippery, liquid-infused porous surfaces, or slips. We start with a big piece of aluminum. The right is untreated. The left has slips. So we're going to try putting some stuff on each half, and we'll see what sticks. And what slips. <laughs> Well done. First step, chocolate sauce. Haven't I seen this on late night TV? I hate getting chocolate on my aluminum. <laughs> and on slips. Look at that, it beads right off. Now how much would you pay? Cleaning off the chocolate with water works, but not as easily as slips. By gosh, Phil, you didn't even need that water. It rolled right off. But let's raise the stakes. Next up, motor oil. Oh, Phil, you're ruining this perfectly good sheet of aluminum. aluminum. That'll <laughs> never come off. What? It rolls right off. While well, this one leaves a stain that is not going to be removed even with washing. It's and actually on... getting even dirtier. And on the slip side, no contest. Well, I can't imagine anything much worse than motor oil. <gasps> Liquid asphalt. If we had a studio audience, they'd be going, oh. And on slips. Come on. Even tar rolls off like off a duck's back. Seriously, it's an amazing display of unstickiness. And it works in a totally different way than the current king of unsticky, Teflon. Teflon is a plastic polymer, a long chain of repeating molecules. It has a carbon backbone with fluorine atoms tightly bonded to it on the outside. The fluorine acts as a shield, preventing the normally reactive carbon from bonding with anything else, the secret of Teflon's unstickiness. But slips works in a totally different way, on the pitcher plant principle. First, Joanna adds a porous material less than a hundredth of a centimeter thick to the stuff she wants to protect. In some cases, just by spraying it on. 
Then she adds a liquid, often an oil, that seeps in. The layer and the liquid are formulated to attract each other, keeping the liquid in place. Just like the water on the lip of the pitcher plant, the liquid creates a smooth, non-stick surface on top. Joanna believes there are lots of applications. Graffiti a problem? Not on the side that's been treated with slips. Slips helps prevent ice buildup by repelling water before it has time to freeze. And if ice forms, slips defrosts more quickly, which may lead to applications in refrigeration and the de-icing of planes. It's a clever use of biology as inspiration. By inspired is more taking some clever solution and maybe reformulating it in a different way, using something different that nature doesn't use, but the design is preserved. So slips would bear the label based on an idea by nature. That's right. And of course, the research continues. Rinse. Slips, it's absolutely repellent. Slips cleverly adapts one of nature's innovations. But increasingly, scientists have been asking a new question. Can we adapt not only the stuff nature makes, but also the way nature makes stuff? Today's manufacturing consumes vast amounts of natural resources while creating mountains of waste, some of which is toxic. Take paper. To make a ton of it, you start with almost twice as much wood and generate thousands of pounds of waste. The leather industry is even worse. One ton of finished leather requires over five tons of the raw stuff. Compare that to the natural growth of plants and animals. They take what they need to build their bodies. No blasting furnaces, no acid baths, no pounding machinery and waste that recycles easily. What if we could recruit nature to grow the stuff we need for our technology? What if we could grow a car or a computer or a cell phone? Can we make our manufacturing more like nature's? MIT professor Angela Belcher may have taken the first step toward realizing that dream. Well, I'm really interested in how nature makes materials, how organisms in the ocean have evolved to use just the elements of their environment to make really exquisite materials, like this, uh, this abalone shell here. Angela first took inspiration from the abilities of the humble abalone, whose intricately structured shell is made in part out of calcium. Over the course of its life, the abalone takes calcium atoms from the ocean and slowly assembles them into its strong shell, a talent its ancestors likely developed several hundred million years ago. Which made Angela ask a question. If life could learn to build a shell with calcium, could it learn to build stuff using other elements, like the ones we use for our technology? It didn't seem likely. If you look at the periodic table, Life primarily uses only six elements, along with a smattering of others. On the other hand, our technologies, our computers, our electronics, rely heavily on elements that nature largely ignores. Angela wondered, could she coax organisms into building stuff out of our high-tech elements? Let's say, a battery? Batteries have three components. A negatively charged electrode, a positively charged electrode, and a separator called an electrolyte. To test her idea, Angela decided to make a negative electrode by growing it. But what creature would do the growing? She sends me down to the water, promising to show me the type of organism she recruited. I got, oh. I'm sorry, I did not actually manage to get any sea organisms in there. You did. There's actually uh, tens of millions of viruses in the sample. Viruses? Is this one of those medical waste beaches? No, these are viruses that are a natural part of the environment and really in part of the ecosystem of the ocean. It turns out that viruses are actually the most abundant organisms in the ocean. 
A teaspoon alone holds over 10 million of them. Viruses come in all kinds of shapes, but in some ways, they're all the same. They're each a little bit of genetic material wrapped in a protective coating. Scientists have learned how to change the genetic material inside some viruses, altering their behavior, making some strains into popular and safe lab tools for research. For her work, Angela chose one of those safe lab viruses, which happens to be long and thin, a little like a pencil. This virus reproduces by latching onto a bacterium, injecting its DNA, and forcing the bacterium to produce millions of copies of the pencil-shaped virus. I have a model with me. This, this is what a virus looks like? Yeah, exactly like that. So I have a model here. Is that much a much better yeah. one, yeah. So this, this is designed to stab the bacteria. That's exactly right, like okay. the pencil stabs. But yep. you're going to teach it a new trick. Right. I'm going to teach it, um, to, instead of to bind a bacteria, to grow an electronic material. <laughs> Come on! That's like saying, well, this is where I'm going to teach the rabbit to do microsurgery. The virus normally sticks to the outside of the bacterium it targets. But what Angela wanted was for the virus to bond with little bits of metal. And yes, that is weird. So imagine these are um, tiny bits of metal that's going to be part of a battery electrode. Now, this virus has not been repurposed yet, so it has no ability to bind this material. So if there's no reason that it would bind these uh, small pieces of metal. The stickiness her virus has for a material is determined by the virus's outer coat, which in turn is built by its DNA. So Angela had to change the DNA, rearranging its A, C, G, and T building blocks to change the outer coat so metal would stick to it. And you have the ability to modify, mutate their DNA? That's right. We're going to go in and we're going to add DNA sequences to them, but we're going to do it, add random DNA sequences. So it's like rolling a bunch of dice. Angela used a process called directed evolution. She randomly mixed the A, C, G, and T building blocks of DNA and inserted the bits into the virus, creating billions of variations. Then she tested them to see which viruses bonded to electrode material until she found the one that worked best. What you get is a virus that's completely coated in that metal that makes up this battery electrode material. Just like an abalone assembles calcium into a shell, her virus could now assemble metal into a tiny electrode. By packing together millions of the metal-coated viruses, Angela made a negative electrode large enough for a battery. She repeated the process to create a virus that assembled the positive electrode. Adding an off-the-shelf electrolyte completed her virus battery. The virus batteries can take many shapes. These are coin batteries used in electronics. And Angela has created about 100 other specialized viruses that make other products, including solar cells with improved performance thanks to the virus inside, and specialized materials that enable chemical reactions, catalysts, that create fuels. Is this all about making better batteries and solar cells then, or is this something bigger? Well, I think it's, I think it's something bigger. It's a, a new way of manufacturing materials. Use biology to come up with new ways of manufacturing materials that have improved performance.